And what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen and we'll talk through what we're going to talk through and then we'll talk through it. And that there will be, I think we have plenty of time for questions and stories because that's part of what we're getting together for is to uh, join friends who also like birds and nature and wildlife. So um, I'm going to share my screen here and we can start looking at beautiful pictures. Um, okay, so you should all see an opening slide there. I'm going to show video panel so I can see you all if we do end up talking. Um, so we're going to talk about bird feeding today. I've given a series of these talks for Stillwater Library, um, including about beginning birding or not even beginning birding, birding, uh, bird being bird friendly. Um, and because there were so many questions in those talks about feeding, uh, we decided to put a feeding talk together. So uh, again, thanks to Jody for hosting. Um, we do have the Q&A and chat functions. P P please feel free to use those or like Jody said, I'll stop a couple of times and we can um, just ask, ask a few questions, you know, either in person or chat, whatever you feel most comfortable with. Um, and then Jody, are you recording? Um, yes, I have it. Recording. Okay, very good. All right, I just wanted to remind you to do that. So we will make the recording available afterwards if you have to cut out early or if you want to watch it later or show anybody, just uh, do what you will with that. So um, quickly, I want to introduce myself. And while I do that, feel free to write in the chat where you are joining us from. It's kind of fun with this virtual world that uh, people can join from all over the place. And we have people that have had people joining from all different um, states even. So um, pop that in there if you feel like sharing. Um, for me, I want to start here with a shout out to my parents. My interest in birds, um, as we remember it anyway, started with a bird, a bird feeder. Uh, that sparked a natural interest that caught my parents a bit off guard. Um, but they jumped right in uh, and cultivated my interest and found outlets for them. And that turned out to be pretty fun for my parents too. Um, they, especially my mom, actually ended up focusing a lot of time um, on birds and birding throughout her life too. Um, so bird feeding really can change your life. It uh, really can make a big difference and produce a lifelong hobby. Uh, and contributions to science and things like that. Um, so professionally, I've worked with or on behalf of birds my entire career. Right now, I'm serving as the curator of birds um, at the Raptor Center at the University of Minnesota. So I am responsible for the care and management of our education team. Uh, so that's a team of about 30 uh, plus ambassador birds, and those are the birds that live with us permanently. They can't be released, uh, and they help us in our mission to educate people about raptors and the world we share. So if you're interested in raptors uh, and you're interested in a close-up and personal experience, I'll just make a little plug uh, for our digital programs. They've been super fun and surprisingly intimate. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, they're easy to find on our website. So um, if you want a fun experience with a raptor, one of these guys, uh, close up, one or more. Um, so if you've been to any of my talks before, you might remember these first few slides because I like to kind of lay out the context for the importance of birds and birding just in general in our lives. So uh, birds, are amazing in so many ways. Um, even the most common species can, can have the most amazing adaptations uh, or skills or abilities. Uh, the things that we're learning now about birds and their social systems and their memory systems um, are really surprising. So crows create tools, they can recognize human faces Chickadees can remember the locations of thousands of cached seeds. 
Um, really, I doubt there's any species that doesn't have some kind of secret. <laughs> uh, and I like the chickadee because for me, that was that first visitor that changed my life at our feeder when I was about eight years old. That was a chickadee. Um, and after that first identification, I memorized the bird book and the search for birds kind of started in my life. Um, so birds are also uh, kind of a miracle in their variety, uh, but they also are important. They're kind of essential. Uh, and when they do well, so do people. So birds are insect predators and they're seed dispersers. Uh, they're pollinators. Uh, they are hunters and they are hunted. <laughs> And they're key indicators of the quality and health of the environment. Um, and also they're amazing and fascinating to watch as part of a $41 billion industry, believe it or not. Uh, also birds are protected with very few exceptions. They're protected by state and federal laws. Uh, they're also really accessible. Birds are a lot of times our best connection with nature. So on a day like today, when you may not see uh, much else, uh, you can see birds out there. So uh, many of them have adapted extremely well to living around us. So on any given day, at any given time, you have a good chance of seeing some kind of a bird. So for all those reasons, I advocate for your interest in birds. <laughs> uh, so today what we're going to talk about is feeding um, as a pastime. We're going to talk a bit about uh, who to feed, like what birds will come. Uh, we're going to talk about how to feed them uh, in terms of feeders and types of foods. Uh, we're going to talk about some tips about how to, you can attract more birds, how to protect the birds that you do attract, and then a bit about getting more out of your hobby by contributing to science. Sometimes uh, that can um, just add a whole new dimension to feeding and bird watching. So that's what's on the agenda. <laughs> uh, so starting with kind of the popularity of bird feeding. So already uh, in the US, the estimate is about 57 million households feed backyard birds, and they spend more than $4 billion annually on bird food. <laughs> and with the pandemic, feeding has definitely increased. So um, there's some preliminary data that I was able to find that showed uh, increase in between 10 and 15% last spring, um, kind of in the birding category um, based on data by a company that makes kind of products for bird feeding. So um, definitely people being home more have started to notice birds more um, and it's showing up in the marketplace. So downloads for uh, bird identification apps for your phone, um, those have increased like 100% over the same time last year. Uh, people are visiting the live bird cams. I don't know if you've ever seen any of those, but really fun to watch the different cameras. Um, and then people have been using and, and um, contributing their uh, sightings to another app called eBird where people can put in what they've seen and also images and also uh, recordings. So those things have all increased in this time where most of us are, are um, our uh, schedules have changed a little, putting a lot of people uh, at home. So birding and bird feeding is therapy too. <laughs> um, so on that note, why should we feed birds? Um, what are the different, some different reasons to feed birds? And uh, really put simply, it's good for birds and it's good for us. <laughs> so feeding is good for birds in general. Uh, there may be some risks such as disease and predation at your feeders, but generally there's more positives than negatives to feeding birds. They find most of their food outside of your feeders. So there's no risk whatsoever in making birds reliant on feeders. It's kind of the opposite. Feeding can be a really important supplement to birds in hard times. 
A um, couple examples are um, bluebirds. When bluebirds come back in March, the weather can be very unpredictable. So something like offering mealworms to bluebirds can actually help them get through like a blizzard in March or on the same token, um, keeping those nectar feeders out in the fall uh, can really help uh, those hummingbirds that are migrating late in the fall and just need that extra energy or honestly in the spring too when you get those cold nights. So um, birds lives really revolve around this ability to keep track of and continuously search for food sources. So if yours is empty, they'll just go elsewhere. It's okay. Um, but feeding is good for us too. It's fun. It can be even competitive. It can contribute to science. Um, it can calm us in times of stress, and it also connects us with the local ecosystem and to wild birds as individuals. So like today, uh, we have this week 11 doves, and today I only saw 10, so I'm worried about that 11th one until I spot him, you know? So it really connects you to them as individuals, and that can be a lot of fun. So I loved this quote that I found. Um, uh, from an author, and she says, now that we've entered the time of New Year's resolutions, eager for a fresh start after such a difficult year, I believe more strongly than ever that birding is the antidote to despair. And she was one that uh, started into birding when she first looked at a red-winged blackbird and kind of couldn't believe the beauty of this uh, relatively common bird. So. Um, I like that quote because um, I do think birds can be very therapeutic um, to watch. So that's kind of why. <laughs> um, and we think about who will come. So who can we hope for and who can we expect to come if we embark on or uh, get deeper into bird feeding? And it really totally depends on where you are um, what habitat kind of surrounds your property and also what the broader ecosystem is like surrounding your property itself. So we can manipulate who comes to a certain degree based on what we provide, um, but some of it is in, gonna be inherent in what's around us. And so uh, to get a little bit of a, an idea of who might come, it's kind of helpful to, um, get a perspective about how many birds are here at any given time in Minnesota. So it's easy to be overwhelmed at how many birds there are to learn in Minnesota. Um, our numbers in winter are much more manageable and at our feeders even better than that. So typically um, kind of the, the these are the, the breakdown of numbers. In Minnesota, the most birds that have ever or the the total number of species that are considered possible in Minnesota is about 450-ish. Now that's if you chase around after the rarities as they come through and you are very uh, active, you're very active birding throughout the entire state. I don't think there's anybody that's seen all, all the possible birds, but people are you know, chasing that dream, if you will. <laughs> uh, the next breakdown is kind of what we call regular species. That's the species that are uh, not including the real rarities. Um, in summer, those are the breeding birds. So about 275 species breed here or stay here in the summer. That tends to be breeding season. Um, in the winter, the birds that just winter here and don't clear out for warmer climates, um, is even less than that, about 150 total species. And then um, at your feeders, I just use myself, our feeders as an example. So we participate in a program called Project Feeder Watch, which I'll talk about at the end and see if any of you have done that too. Um, and in Project Feeder Watch, when I look at my own statistics, the most species we've ever had on one sort of watch period, so a two day stretch, has, it's about 20, but overall we've reported about 42 species into feeder watch over the years. So that's why I say, you know, feeders could be 20 to 40 species and it does depend on where you live, but that helps you to 
um, sort of get a sense of what we're talking about here and it helps make it a little bit more manageable to learn them and um, think about attracting them. Because simply put, most a lot of birds aren't attracted to feeders. So we're talking about a subset as it is. Okay. <laughs> All right, so then before we get into feeders and foods, we'll talk a moment about kind of the original bird feeders, which were our plants, of course, especially native plants. So one of the most important things that you can do for birds in your, on your property, even if you just have a small amount of space um, for birds, but also for pollinators and for other animals is to plant native plants. So. Um, this is our front yard in summer, which looks so wonderful. <laughs> we'll just have to think ahead to that. Um, and the reason native plants are so important is because they are sources of seeds and nectar and pollen for insects. Um, so it's really important. Uh, native insects are not attracted to cultivated non-native plants. So when you look at this, I want you to kind of see bird feeders here. Even though we're looking at plants, I want you to see bird feeders. And when you look at cultivated plants, like typical um, you know, landscaping plants that aren't necessarily native, I want you to see, like they can be beautiful, but, but in terms of feeding animals, I want you to see sort of like a fake plastic plant. Like that's the, the imagery we have to sort of get in our minds. Uh, because native plants uh, feed native insects. So birds are attracted to native plants as kind of bird feeders, partly because they do produce seeds. So some birds do eat the seeds that plants provide. But the importance of native plants to birds is about insects. So with few exceptions, so most birds, most terrestrial birds feed their young insects. So they have to feed them insects in order for their chicks to grow and mature properly. Um, small birds like chickadees or bluebirds, they might bring literally 10 to 15,000 individual larval insects or caterpillars back to feed just one brood of chicks. <laughs> so 10 to 15,000, that's just like staggering. So a larger bird like a cat bird, which is what's on your right, um, they might, they'll need even more insects. So that's why native plants are so important and they need to be accessible for those hardworking parent birds to like find without traveling too far. So the more native plants you have on your property, the more chance you'll have of attracting breeding birds uh, to come and stay and be successful. So that's native plants. I'm, I can talk way more about it which we have in some of these other talks, but that's the main thing I'll say about it for now as a food source, uh, very important. And not just in summer, um, but also in winter. Na native plants um, are super important in winter. Um, a lot of pollinators overwinter in their stalks. Um, they provide cover, uh, they provide seed sources, and actually they're also very beautiful in winter too. So. Lots of good reasons for native plants year round. So I'm gonna go through somewhat of a top 10 uh, bird foods in Minnesota and try to include pictures, I'll include be including pictures of different feeder types that are typically used to feed those food types, if you know what I mean. And of course, different birds that like different types of food and feeders, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So different foods, different feeders to provide those foods, and then a little bit about who likes what. <laughs> and so if you're looking to attract specific types of birds, um, you can maybe get some, some tips here. But before I go into that, questions so far? Any? There was qu one question in the chat that said, what feed should we have for bluebirds in March? Okay. I'll get there. Great. That's one of my top 10. All right, so I'll show you that. Okay, so let's talk about feeders. And I'm gonna show you my yard 
This is, I've got a re, I actually took this picture because of all the Blue Jays. You'll find in this presentation, I love Blue Jays. Um, and uh, there were so many Blue Jays in this image, but I like it because it gives, lets me give you an overview of kind of the setup we have and what we provide. So this is a lot of different kinds of feeders. Um, and in addition, we have a pond in the summer and we have a brush pile that's kind of hidden back behind, um, back behind uh, the, the snag there, which is the name for a, like we use for a dead tree left standing. So we actually killed that tree on purpose uh, to provide perching and to provide um, habitat um, for birds. So that's an idea. So we'll talk about all these things, but this is just an idea of some different types of feeders and how you might arrange them. So many options. And so I'll talk first about kind of what, if you're gonna feed one thing, if you just, if you haven't started feeding and you wanna just start one place, this is your best overall seed for starting out or for attracting a lot of variety of birds. It's called a black oil sunflower seed. So there's two kinds of sunflower seeds typically, and I will show you the other kind next. Um, but the black oil sunflower is kind of a small sunflower seed. Um, it's used in mixes or it can be fed on its own. Um, it's one of the best foods in general. It's, it's high in protein and it's easy for small and larger birds to break open. So it's kind of the best all around bird seed for general feeding. So if you were to start somewhere, you get a certain uh, kind of feeder, which we would call a hopper feeder. So it's a kind of a many, many different types of open um, or this top one is sort of a closed feeder with ports on the side that let the seed out or a big open one like this can be used for a black oil sunflower. And I'll show you, there'll be some different examples of all kinds of other feeders as we go to. So starter food, great one, black oil sunflower. Also in the sunflower seed category and high on the preferred foods list, um, are other forms of sunflower. So either striped sunflowers, which you can see they actually are bigger. At those, well, you know, maybe you can't tell that they're bigger, but they are slightly bigger than the black oils and they have a stripe on them. Um, they're not quite as high in oil, uh, maybe hence the name of the other one. Um, they're a little bit harder for smaller birds to break open, but they're good for big birds like cardinals and grosbeaks. Um, Another sunflower like delivery method is by is offering sunflower hearts. Um, and that's kind of like the, the, the holes, the shells have been removed. And so this seed is more waste free and it's a good choice for like, if you're feeding on a deck or a patio, it tends to be a little cleaner. Um, it does spoil a little more quickly if it's, if it's hot out. Um, so it's a really good winter feed. Now for, for us, we get, we buy um, the sunflower hearts in um, and we mix it with another seed, which I'll talk about in a little bit in our, in a tube feeder. So, um, so I, I included this photo because this is literally just a cutoff stump that is a potentially good feeder for, um, for, just spreading seed on top of. And this is a um, seed mix and that is um, a dark eyed junco. I did try to label the birds, but I was adding pictures so much at the end that I didn't get them all labeled. So apologies for that. And if you have any questions about who anybody is, uh, we can go back to them. So, okay, so sunflowers. Hey Joanna. And then, yeah. Um, there was one question just put in the chat. It says, hi, I'm Sylvia and I'm five. Birds are so cool. How long does it take seeds to spoil? Ah, uh, well, how long does it take seeds to spoil? So um, generally they don't spoil super easily, but some kinds can spoil in hot weather. Um, so seeds that are high in oil or um, if they're left in the heat and they get kind of oil old, um, or if they get wet, they can spoil. So, um, and how long does it take? I don't know exactly. It kind of depends on what their situation is, like what the conditions are. Um, and I'm so glad you joined us and I'm so glad you love birds because now you have a 
um, you have such a long life to watch birds and it's great. And you will see the world totally different than people your own age as you grow up. So that's awesome. <laughs> okay, so here's some birds that love sunflower seeds. Um, the colorful bird on the right is a rose-breasted grosbeak. That's a male. And they're here in the summer. So they're a migratory bird. They'll arrive here in May typically and stay through September. Uh, and they are a good reason to keep sunflower seeds on offer all summer long. So this guy's eating black oil sunflower. You can see that beak is made for this. So their beak is made specifically for cracking open large shells and uh, sunflower seeds are great for them. You'll notice the similarity between this beak and this beak of the cardinal. So these two are related, they're kind of cousins. Uh, they're both in this gross beak family. The cardinal just didn't get the name gross beak, uh, but this is a male and female cardinal and they were, are also uh, real common visitors to sunflower feeders. Uh, this I put in because I love this picture that shows two different common, well, two different finches. I won't say common. It does, it depends on where you live, but finches can be very um, eruptive, meaning that sometimes they're here and sometimes they're not. And they move around a lot. They'll bomb in and be at your feeders for a few days, like could be lots of them and then they'll be gone and you don't know where they are. But in different years have different numbers of finches. So this year luckily happens to be a good finch year in general. And I wanted to show you these two. I don't know if we're gonna have time at the end to talk through some difficult challenging IDs. I do have some slides at the end, but I'm, we don't always get to them. But these two are interesting. So look at these two next to each other. These are two kinds of finches. This one here in the middle is called a house finch. It's the female. This one is a purple finch. Uh, and the difference, the I, way to identify the difference, and this isn't a great picture. I do have other pictures, but the, the, the thing to notice is the strong eye line on the purple finch. And they also have a more uh, more white kind of look to their belly, whereas we'll we'll get some other pictures of the house finch and we'll see that they're more um more kind of muddy looking. Their their stripes aren't so distinctive, but that's kind of a fun comparison there of the females. Okay, so more birds that like sunflower seeds. Um, this actually is interesting. This is the female grosbeak. And you can see, I'll go back one. She actually looks kind of similar to the purple finch. Um, little more kind of bold in her patterns and a little more brown. But here's the male and female grosbeak. Tufted titmice are here in Minnesota. I have never gotten them at my feeder, but somebody, a friend of mine who lives very close to me gets them regularly at her feeders. These small birds like the nuthatches and chickadees they will prefer the black oil sunflower seeds over the striped sunflower seeds just because they're smaller and their beaks are not quite as strong. Okay, so next, <clears throat> those were just sunflowers straight up, like uh, not in a mix. Then there's all kinds of mixes that people put together that include sunflower seeds and other seeds. So uh, cardinal mix is one of them and it's kind of a premium mix uh, it attracts a lot of desirable birds. So it has black oil sunflowers in it, striped sunflowers in it, and also some seeds like safflower, which we'll show in a minute, uh, and then peanuts uh, in like little parts, not whole peanuts. And then this is an example of another type of feeder that could be used for feeding sunflower or these mixes. And it's kind of like a hanging platform feeder. So that's one of our feeders in our yard. Actually, my daughter made it in like second grade or something and we still have it. <laughs> it's got some patches, but we still use it. Uh, these are some other examples of what we would call a, a tray feeder or a fly through feeder. This one is where birds can 
enter one side and exit the other side. Uh, all of these are really appropriate for sunflower seeds or mixes. The one challenge with them can sometimes be that the seed can get wet in them or snow can pile in these open ones. Uh, so you kind of have to do a little of maintenance on those. And then here's some examples of those logs. Um, this is the same log I showed you earlier, but we uh, over here, um, but we carved down into it to make more of a um, more of a depression for seeds as was done with this log here. But you can really just use the surface of a stump if you have it. That makes a nice place to view birds and it makes um, a nice place to put a variety of seeds. Small amounts, but kind of fun. This is a really cool use, again, blue jays I love, um, of a, a rock with a depression in it made to uh, hold black oil sunflower seeds and obviously um, was great at attracting these blue jays. I've also seen rocks like this used as, as bird baths. Um, so that's kind of a fun idea. So that's kind of sunflowers. Next one I want to talk about is safflower. So safflower um, is a kind of has a, a slick surface. So it can be difficult for some birds that that some people are trying not to attract. Um, birds like house sparrows or starlings can find this, this seed a little bit less desirable. Apparently bears and squirrels don't like it. Um, and apparently this golden safflower, which is the bottom one that's more golden, um, is kind of a newer variety that's apparently easier to crack open. But cardinals do like safflower. That's why it's included in many of those, the cardinal mix like I just talked about. Okay, so the next type of seed I wanna talk about is millet. So millet is kind of a small, inexpensive grain, and it's a popular ingredient in especially like cheaper mixes, like a mix you might get at the grocery store or something like that. Sometimes those mixes are lower quality and I wouldn't necessarily recommend them. And sometimes at some times of year, I don't recommend millet because millet can attract house sparrows if your area is prone to them. Um, so it's offered a lot because it's inexpensive, but it can attract undesirable birds, but it can also attract desirable birds. Like the bird in the middle on the bottom is an indigo bunting, one of our most beautiful uh, migratory songbirds. So they arrive in like May and in May and June, they will sometimes come to millet feeders. So, and also let's see, this guy on top here is called an American tree sparrow. Tree sparrows are with us only in the winter time, which is super interesting. So when they come in the winter, they're actually coming south to be with us. So when they migrate out of the colder, like Canada and Northern Minnesota, they consider this nice and warm or balmy here and they, they spend the winters with us, but they can also sometimes, um, really enjoy some millet in one of those mixes. So that's a good option. Okay, the next one I wanna talk about is Niger, sometimes spelled N-I-G-E-R or thistle um, seed. And I just included these three fun images of our tube feeder. And this is the one I was mentioning that we'll use um, not thistle seed and we'll mix it together with those sunflower hearts. So little chips of sunflower. And there's just a tiny, tiny holes uh, let the seed out of these feeders. So you can't put larger seeds into these feeders. The birds won't be able to get them out. But the thistles are real small seed and the black and the sunflower chips are a really small seed. And these, these birds here are a variety of two different species that often will come to these thistle feeders or to finch mixes. And there's two different species here. And some of you might know them, but what I'll do is I'll kind of highlight them both and tell you a little bit about them. So um, the first one I wanna look at with you is this one. Um, so this one, is called a common red pole named for the, oops, 
named for the red on their pole, the top of their head. These are in that category of these eruptive finches. So sometimes they come in the winter, sometimes you'll hardly see any. So it's really kind of like a gambling thing. You don't know when you're gonna get them. And then the other one I wanna point out on these photos is these guys on the bottom of this image here. They're real uh, easy to confuse with the red poles, but these guys are called pine siskins. And the thing to notice on them is if you see the yellow in their wings. I also always notice with siskins is they have a super pointy beak, so almost a needle-like beak. And you really can notice that even if you don't get a good look at them enough to see the yellow. Um, but those are some fun winter visitors you might get at your thistle feeders. Okay, fun. All right, the other thing, so all these things, I mentioned that when we started off, if you're just starting, just think about adding a, like a one sunflower feeder and then all these other things, if you know, kind of pick where you are and maybe hopefully you'll be able to find one thing in here, if you're adding on, that is, uh, you know, a fun thing for you to consider adding on. And um, peanuts are one that I always recommend. There's many forms you can offer peanuts in, um, but it's a great ingredient for attracting birds and also for adding to other mixes. So these are just some examples, three different examples of how peanuts can be fed. Uh, they just need some kind of a cage system, if you're using a cage, that the birds can kind of peck in and peck at the peanuts until they're small enough to pull out or until they can break off a little chip off of them. And so this is like a hardware cloth feeder. Uh, this one is a really pretty feeder. I took a picture of down at the National Wildlife Refuge. I thought it was so pretty. Um, and then this one is actually more of a hopper that holds a whole bunch of, of peanuts. And then these ports or, or you know, access points are larger. So they're large enough for the peanuts to come out, but they don't you know, sort of spill out. So peanut parts is one way of offering peanuts. They're also sometimes called pickups, peanut pickouts, or um, I think they have some different names for them, but basically they're shelled peanuts of different small sizes. Um, and here's a bunch of different birds that are eating those peanuts or nuts of some kind out of different types of feeders. Um, so these again are peanut parts um, or whole peanuts without the shell. Oops, oops, I went the wrong way, sorry guys. Okay, this is a really fun thing to offer. Again, on the Blue Jay bandwagon, I love them. I think they're so beautiful. A lot of people don't like them because they're kind of, um, Oh, they're just, they sometimes scare the other birds away. They just have a more boisterous uh, approach and personality. Um, but there's, here's two different ways of feeding whole peanuts that blue jays love. Uh, so the first one, the top one is actually a suet feeder and it's big enough that uh, it holds the peanuts in, but the, the, um, the birds, blue jays and woodpeckers and chickadees will come to this, um, can peck at them and get the peanuts themselves out. The wreath feeder is actually made specifically for feeding peanuts, whole peanuts in the shell. And it's kind of like a slinky, if you remember the slinky, um, so it so the, the distance between those coils moves and the, the blue jays will come and pull the whole peanuts out of there. And they typically go like, 20 feet and bury them in the yard. So that's kind of funny. Or they'll take them between their feet and pound on them until they open them up. So peanuts in the shell, very fun um, way to feed blue jays. And you'll start to get to know the blue jays in your yard and they'll have a different, they have different personalities in terms of their approach to how they, they, they get the peanuts out of this kind of feeder. So some of them hang upside down, some of them come to the top, some of them do a bit of a flyby and grab one that's like hanging out a little bit. So it can be really fun to watch them. <laughs> um, then peanut butter. Peanut butter is a, another good thing to offer. You can literally smear it on something like a 
pine cone is the classic one, or you can literally put it right on a branch or on the trunk of a tree. Um, it's really good for attracting chickadees, woodpeckers, nut hatches, and it'll just kind of freeze in the in the um, uh, cold weather. So you know it'll it could attract other things too, which we'll talk about kind of other visitors at the end. Uh, peanut butter meal mixes. That's a way of mixing things together, like corn meal with peanut butter. And there's recipes you can get. I also have made those and put you know, some seed in them sometimes. And then you can feed them in a log that you've literally just drilled holes into. So you can see by this downy woodpecker's um, foot, uh, an empty hole where that one's been cleaned out. And then this is one that's packed full. Also, I just noticed with this guy, this is kind of an interesting downy woodpecker. This is a juvenile, young downy woodpecker. Um, when they're young, they have red on the top of their head, which can be real, was really confusing to me when I first saw that. I don't know what happens to it if it if these feathers molt out and new ones molt in here, but their typical red patch is on the back of their head. So that's just kind of something interesting as an aside there. <laughs> okay, number seven, we're working through 10, 10 top foods, um, suet and deer fat. So this is an amazing pileated woodpecker eating um, suet, which again is like, um, sometimes you can get it at a butcher and it's literally fat from like, you know, cows. Uh, and they'll save it and either sell it. They used to give it away, but the bird feeding has gotten so popular now that they sell it now. Um, it's sometimes hard to find. So you just, ha you literally have to ask the butcher and they'll tell you where it's placed. Um, so suet is a really um, high energy food and it's really good for these um, birds in winter time. Whole bunch of different birds using suet. These are some different woodpeckers, chickadee, and even the colorful one on the lower right here, that one's a yellow rumped warbler. Um, they'll sometimes eat suet when they're coming back north in the springtime. Um, and so that's a potentially fun food to offer. Different ways of offering it include these cages, um, a variety of different cages that are made for offering suet. Let me just show you some fun things here too. I don't know how well you can see this, but the way you can tell male from female pileated woodpeckers is by two things. This is a female and she only has red on the tip of her cap, whereas he has red all the way down to his beak. He also has a red mustache and she has a black mustache. So that's kind of fun. So they both have red, they just have it in different places. Okay, this is kind of a fun um, feeder orientation. And there's some made like this that are kind of upside down. So it allows the woodpeckers and chickadees that like to hang upside down, it allows them to feed, but it can um, discourage birds like starlings or other birds that you might not like at your suet to uh, to come. And this is kind of fun. This is a red bellied woodpecker and you rarely see their red belly, but he has a little, you can see this red belly. Um, so that's kind of fun. <laughs> and here's a homemade feeder. This is a birch log that's been cut. You can see the pattern that was cut out of it and literally um, hardware cloth um, and a hardware cloth put over the opening to make a big kind of um, open area for suet, and then a hook uh, installed on the top. And this, the reason I wanted to show you this is because this is kind of, it shows you that is a style of feeder that the woodpeckers really like. If you see this solid extension going down, um, that helps uh, woodpeckers because they uh, like to prop themselves up with their very stiff tails. So you can see this bird is holding his tail against that uh, wooden part of the feeder, which is specifically made for that purpose. Um, and then this one I saw among my photos, it just shows, and I'll show you kind of a close up of those tail feathers. 
So woodpecker tail feathers are really hard and stiff and made to help them prop themselves up against a tree um, or in this case against a feeder. And here's actually an image I noticed. Uh, this is actually a, sort of a, a different way of providing that same thing, suet. Um, but it's like a deer rib cage, which may be more than you want to try to offer in your suburban yard. Um, but if there are any, any hunters in your family, um, this is a really cool way of, uh, especially if you have property and you can do this um, more out in the open um, of offering feeder, a feeder for woodpeckers and chickadees. This is a picture from up north. Um, where it was also attracting gray jays, or they're now called Canada jays, which are a, a species of jay that lives in northern Minnesota. And then this is a hairy woodpecker, our larger, the larger of our, our two common woodpeckers. And you can see this bird is also propping his tail, or using his tail to prop himself up on that. So kind of cool. Okay, we're at number eight. After number 10, we'll stop and talk about any questions you guys have about any of these. Um, so number eight is offering fruit for the birds. Now you can offer fruit. Um, I think that the activity that Jody shared is an example of offering fruit in the winter, um, kind of frozen in different formats. Um, but fruit typically is offered more in the spring, summer, and fall. Um, you can you can offer almost any kind of fruit that you have left over or you have on hand. And um, if birds don't eat it, often butterflies will come to it. Um, so I offer it like in a, I literally just use a saucer, like a terracotta saucer from a plant pot, you know, uh, something like that. Um, and you can put um, fruit in the open on that. If you have something like the end of a watermelon or something like that, or we've also done this where we have a nail um, in a piece of driftwood and we just kind of jam uh, oranges or apple halves onto that. Um, so that's a good thing to offer. Um, and these are some, a variety of birds that might be attracted to fruit feeders. More fruit, uh, this is in the form of grape jelly. Um, Orioles will come to grape jelly, um, catbirds. I hear scarlet tanagers, which is in the middle, middle guy, but I've never had one. Uh, they, again, these guys are all migratory birds. So again, it's kind of that May through September time that you're offering jelly. Uh, you can also make kind of a nectar out of jelly. Um, and it's kind of one-to-one -one jelly and water. I've never done that, but I've heard that that can also be used to attract Orioles. Okay, now the question somebody asked, what can we offer in March to attract and support bluebirds? Um, mealworms. Mealworms come either live and you can get them at bird feed stores, or you can get them also at pet stores because people buy them to feed their pets like um, lizards and snakes and things like that. Um, and you can just feed them also in kind of an open pan feeder. I use a little one that has a top on it so that water doesn't get in it, um, but they're kind of like little little sausages, I guess. <laughs> so they'll attract insect eating birds that aren't attracted to bird seed. So bluebirds aren't attracted to seed, but they'll come to water and they'll come to mealworms. So that's a good offering for bluebirds. And you can get them freeze dried and feed them in the winter time too. More birds eating mealworms. <laughs> Okay, and number 10, last on our list of top 10 foods is nectar, so, or sugar water. You don't need to buy any commercial nectar. You can make this on your own. Um, again, it's kind of May through September. You can, I would leave it out um, even a little longer in case there's some late migrating hummingbirds coming through. Um, but you can get different feeders that attract hummingbirds only or Orioles and hummingbirds. And I'll show you on the next slide, a picture of some sort of Oriole style feeders. Um, but the, the recipe for the 
for nectar that you can make yourself is um, one part sugar to four parts water. And we can talk more if you have questions about how to do that. Let's talk more about it in the questions. Uh, you change it regularly, like change it, have a day a week or even two days a week in hot weather that you change that out. Um, and the really important thing is you don't use any fancy sugars. So don't use organic, don't use coconut sugar, don't use um, anything fancy. You use the plain white cane sugar and you don't need to add color. So some little tips there. And here as promised is the other type of feeder that you put nectar in that um, uh, Orioles can get their beaks into. The opening is a little wider or in the case of the one on the left, that's actually a like a water made for chickens that's been used, modified to be used as, a, as an Oriole nectar feeder. Um, so there are some feeders that both Orioles and hummingbirds can come to, and there's some feeders that um, only hummingbirds can sit at and get their beaks into. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about how to attract more birds, but before we do that, let's find out if there's questions. We technically have till eight o'clock. I didn't wanna to go till eight because I wanted to leave time for questions, but um, if there's any questions now, go ahead on the feed feeders and types of foods. Well, there's one question in the chat, which is not about either of those things. It's about okay. bird baths. <laughs> okay, we're gonna um, talk about bird baths. Okay, yeah, this is another five-year-old, so I don't know if they've hung on long enough to listen to the answer to this. Ah, okay. <laughs> but they well, said, they... Um, why do people put rocks in their heated ah. bird baths to keep birds from freezing and dying on really cold days? <laughs> no, not quite, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll address that. So that's sort of in the section about attracting more birds. So that's what we're going to talk about next, ways that you can increase the number of birds at your, at your property. Um, There's and... one other question that's, yeah. that was just put out. It says, do dead bees or gnats in nectar hurt the nectar? Um, no, they don't really. Although um, I usually change it when a lot of bees get in there. I don't, I don't think it hurts anything. I always kind of, this sounds kind of weird, but I always think of it as sort of like added, potentially added protein. I don't know if there's truth to that or not, but when a lot of bees get kind of drowned in there, I do tend to clean them out. Um, and then you can sometimes rescue some of the bees that aren't, haven't died if you do that, um, if you change them pretty often. So, and then gnats, uh, gnats will also get in stuck in the um, jelly. And I, again, I sometimes think that's probably added nutrition. So, I don't think right. it harms it too much, but it's an indicator that it's probably been out there a little too long. If you get yeah, that was the other comment um, that same person said, please stress the importance of cleaning feeders, especially nectar feeders. I've seen really dirty ones hanging on poles. Yeah, and so what I do with mine, and that's a good time to mention it now in case we don't get back to it. Um, what I do with mine is I just have multiple sets. I think we might have like four. <laughs> and then I bring one in and I, I make, I make the sugar water and I make it in like kind of single dose because I found that it sometimes gets moldy in the fridge if I, even in the fridge, if I put it in the fridge. So I make, um, like I use my two or four cup mixing cup, like a glass Pyrex mixing cup. And I heat the water cause it makes the um, sugar dissolve easier. And then I'll pay, if I use two cups, I put a half a cup of sugar in it, mix it right in there, let it cool, and then put it in my feeders. And then I just swap them out. And then the ones that come in, I clean all the ports by hand with like a little, little tiny bottle brush. And then you can also stick those in the dishwater, washer, dishwater, dishwasher, and that will help to sterilize them because yes, there definitely are dirty, dirty feeders of all kinds out there. So very good to clean them, especially those ones. So thank you for that. Okay, I'm going to talk through, I think it's like four ways or so of attracting more birds. So one way to attract more birds is by offering food in all four seasons. So you don't have to offer all your feeders in all four seasons, but an example might be, you know, you take your peanut feeder down, but you replace it in the spring with a nectar feeder. 
or you add oranges or apples or mealworms or something in the summer. So find different things that you like to feed and offer them at different times of year. Um, water in all four seasons. So we do have the bath, the main picture here and the lower picture are both from our yard. We do offer baths year round. So birds have very little um, feeling or sensitivity in their feet. That doesn't mean that they can't get cold feet um, or they can't get frostbite. They can get both cold feet and frostbite. Um, we use the rocks exactly for to keep them, to give them a place to stand um, that's not in the water um, and uh, to let them get kind of, um, it gives them a little more perching area. So I mentioned the doves this morning, we had like eight doves on our bird bath and they can stand along the edge. And that also gives them an alternative place to stand. Doves, when they drink, need to dip their beak in. Some birds eat, drink by scooping water with their beak and like tipping their head back. You can kind of picture that. Doves have to actually immerse their beak into water that's slightly deeper. So they tend to, I really often see them standing on the rocks and getting to the center of the bath, especially when it's getting a little bit low. And the bath is another thing to really keep clean. So when birds sit on it, they act, go to the bathroom in it. So really important to keep those clean even when it's cold outside. So we bring a bucket of warm, water out a big like five gallon bucket that's more than the can even fit in the feeder and um, you can dump it out and then clean it with like like I just grab handfuls of snow if we have snow scrub it out also bring a scrub brush out use some of your water to clean it and then the rest of your water to fill it and I also clean the rocks off so um, water in all four seasons can be great um, in summer we use we have a pond um, that we've built in our yard with a stream feature. Birds tend to like shallower water. Um, so you don't really even need a, uh, if you make a little recirculating pond of some kind, <clears throat> you really don't need to have it very deep. They like it to be um, literally between like, you know, kind of one and four inches deep and, and a variety of depths is really good. They and songbirds really like this sort of shallow water flowing over rocks. So if you're in the mood or have high um, aspirations, I would really recommend you look into a pond. Ours has gotten more complicated over the years. We added the stream and waterfall a number of years ago, um, but this is such a great attractant for not only birds, but also we get so many frogs. <laughs> So that's kind of fun. They come, we don't, we don't stalk them, they just come. So that's kind of fun. Um, another way of attracting more birds is kind of obvious maybe, but putting out full, more feeders. And um, generally, I don't know if you noticed when um, on the kind of overall view of our yard, we kind of cluster the feeders. That's kind of out of practicality. Um, because it's easier to hang them together on one structure than to find a whole bunch of structures to, to hang them on. Um, and it's also easier to protect them from squirrels, which we're also going to talk about. Um, but you can see these are different ways of offering um, feeders, more feeders in clusters of like three to four together. Um, so lots of different options there. Okay, so then another thing that's really important to do, if you're attracting birds, it's really important to protect the birds you're attracting. And so predators, one of the most dangerous predators that birds face at our feeders is cats that are allowed to be outside. So um, cats, it's super important. This is actually my cat, the orange one. Um, they can lead an awesome life either inside or in a, um, you know, some kind of protected place outside. So um, cats indoors is just a really strong um, message I want to get out. I love cats. I think they're amazing pets, but free roaming cats, whether they have owners or don't have owners, um, are a really devastating problem for birds and also mammals. Um, so cats also that are allowed to roam outside get lost. Uh, they don't live very long. They tend to 
lit die before the age of five. I know you're going to say there's a lot of cats that have lived longer, but statistically, um, they live much shorter lives and much harder lives. So, um, so that's a, a message I always try to get out. Okay, next, protecting birds from your own windows. Um, so this is an issue I've worked a long time on. Um, I spend a lot of time in my career working on bird window collisions. Um, so we need to protect birds from our windows as well as protecting them from cats. So you can reduce window collisions um, a lot of different ways. I'll just show you quickly a few examples. We're not gonna go in depth on this, um, but one way is to put feeders directly on your window surface. Um, that brings birds closer, so it's more fun too. Um, but it uh, can, if they're spooked, it can help them to not hit the window at such a high rate of speed. Uh, it can also make the windows a little bit dirty, which helps them to see where the glass is. Um, so smudged windows can actually be a lifesaver for birds, especially on migration in spring and fall. Another quick, few quick examples, exterior screens, like on the screen porch, are a great way to protect birds from windows. Um, you can hang something like strings. This is parachute cord. This is in our house, um, hung about four inches apart. We can talk about that offline if you want to know how. Uh, you can also get creative and hang other things in front of your windows just to help birds understand that there's something there. Um, typically, you need them at that kind of closer spacing to keep birds from zipping in between them. Um, but this uh, something even space like this can be somewhat helpful. And then um, putting something on the surface of your windows at a pretty uh, close, um, close to one another. So if you put these kind of decals on your windows, they have to be close together. So there has to be a lot of them. Um, so like the pictures of the big windows that are reflecting the sky, you can see that there's a lot of unprotected glass there that birds can just zip between. So you, um, you have to do them in, in um, more dense patterns for them to be um, helpful. Okay, quickly I wanna talk about contributing to science, um, just so that we don't take too long and we leave time for questions. So, um, so there's a, lot, a number of ways you can contribute to science and also learn a lot yourself too. Um, I'm going to talk about just about Project Feeder Watch, and then I'll quickly mention the other three that are listed here. So Project Feeder Watch is uh, a program where you can sign up. It's through the Laboratory of Ornithology at Cornell University, and you can sign up and contribute your sightings to a big database that provides scientists with lots of information. And how it works pretty simply is that you choose feeder watch days for your household. So we do it on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday. You could pick Monday and Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday, whatever you want, but you do it the same days each week. Sometimes you're there, sometimes you're not there. That's okay, you just don't contribute those times. And what you're doing is you're counting the most numbers of any individual species you see at one time. So if you see three blue jays, you count three. If later on in the day you see four blue jays together, not another individual alone, but four blue jays together, then you increase your number from three to four. And everyone's counting species the same way across all over the, the world. I think Feeder Watch, I'm sure if it's worldwide, but I think it might be worldwide. And that uh, offers a systematic way of counting and provides a lot of information for science. So this is just an example. This is where I got the number 42. This was on my stats um, in Feeder Watch. We've, we've entered a total of 42 species um, at our count site, which is our home. Um, we've counted for 12 seasons and you can dig into all of your statistics, which makes it really kind of fun. And you learn a lot by feeding wild birds. So this is another quote I found. Um, feeding wild birds is a deceptively commonplace activity, uh, yet it is one of the most intimate, private, and potentially profound forms of human connection with nature. The people who feed birds are alert to a wide range of additional natural phenomena, meaning when you are paying attention and feeding birds, 
you notice lots of other things in your world too. So it increases our powers of observation. So that's kind of fun and good. Okay, people requested squirrel proofing. So let's talk through squirrel proofing and then quickly we'll talk through other critters that might come to your feeders uh, and then we'll have questions. So I'll try to do this in like five minutes or so. Uh, there's always questions about squirrels so we can talk about those after. So squirrel proofing. So this is a pretty common sight at feeders. Um, squirrels are very smart. If you have watched any of the amazing videos online of people trying to outwit squirrels, you know that squirrels usually tend to win. Uh, so squirrels are amazingly skilled at getting to feeders. Um, and so there's a number of different ways we can go about trying to prevent that. I'll talk you through some of those. Um, but the first thing I'll say is that um, it's fun to kind of make peace with the squirrels um, because they are actually some of the most fun observations we have at our home is watching the squirrels. So they're some of the most entertaining. So I'll just put that out there that it's not all bad to have squirrels at your feeders, but people tend to want them where they want them and not have them getting in and devouring their bird, their feed that's expensive feed that's out for birds. And also sometimes they can damage feeders too because they have those chewing rodent teeth. Okay, so here are some classic ways of um, keeping squirrels out of your main bird feeders. So generally, uh, we try to cut back the things that the plants, the trees that they're leaping to the feeders from, because that's how ours get on the feeders is by jumping from sometimes incredible heights uh, to land on the top of like our platform feeder like this. Um, so, so one way is to eliminate them or reduce their efficiency at getting there by trimming back branches and placing your feeders um, out of the way, uh, out of their jumping range, which can be way bigger than you or way farther than you think. Another way is to protect your feeder with some kind of baffle. So this is literally just a, um, a stove pipe baffle. And this was the best picture I had of it. So I'm gonna have to get a better picture, um, but it's just a round cylinder stove pipe um, that's mounted up under the feeder. And oftentimes we'll see the squirrels climb up the pole and go up into this, but they can't get out of it at the top. And then this one over here on the top left is a classic squirrel guard. Uh, placed right, those can be very effective at keeping birds off the pole um, to your feeders. But if the snow gets high, we find our guys get can get high enough to jump onto the squirrel guard, which gives them access to the feeder. So that does kind of depend. And then the other thing that people often do is they give squirrels a plentiful alternative. So when you give them a lot of food, like one place they can get to food, with food on the ground or in a low place, then oftentimes they're not, uh, they don't, they're not so um, uh, ambitious at getting on your feeders. Um, and here are some other things. This is again, that feeder on the ground, which we give, uh, we fill up with corn for them. Uh, we also have this really cool feeder that we can put whole, um, whole uh, cobs of corn, dried corn onto, and the red squirrels especially love this. And then this is an example of where somebody has drilled walnuts and strung them on a wire um, that, that squirrels can access. And um, they can um, spend, you know, hours feeding at that feeder. So um, those are some ideas of ways of reducing squirrels at your feeders. There's also special feeder types that have um, mesh around them that squirrels can't, and larger birds can't get through. Um, so there's ways of doing that. I've heard people using... Um, a some kind of a peppery sort of um, powder. I've never used that, but I've heard that that can be effective too and the birds don't seem to uh, mind that at all. So those are some ways of, uh, I wouldn't say eliminating what I say, um, reducing squirrel eating at your feeders. 
So we can come back to that. Let me quickly talk about other visitors you might get at your feeders. We'll start with predators. So um, you recognize this feeder by now. That's our feeder with a sharp shinned hawk, which is one of our small um, bird hunting hawks. Kind of a little aside, a lot of times the bird hunting hawks have really long toes. And you can see that's the case with this guy. So skinny little legs and long, long toes are, are typical of bird hunting birds. So falcons like peregrines and kestrels and merlins have those long skinny toes for uh, presumably for grabbing bird bodies and not getting just a fistful of feathers. Uh, and then this other one, this isn't the greatest picture, but this is a bird called a shrike. Uh, there's two kinds of shrikes that come to Minnesota. They look kind of pretty similar. This is a northern shrike. And you can see it has actually a little bit of a hooked beak, but it's not a bird of prey proper, um, but it does hunt other birds. So we'll get them. Um, we'll get shrikes sometimes in the um, winter time and they will chase the birds out. They can't catch very large birds typically. Um, but they can be attracted to areas where birds are super active, like at our feeders. Deer are a common visitor to feeders. Uh, we don't get them very often. I live in Stillwater. Um, we don't get them very often, and we actually kind of enjoy them when they do come, but we know that they can be um, sort of a, a challenge for people um, when they eat a lot of seed, or more importantly, when they eat a lot of those, um, especially ornamental plants. Um, so deer can be also offered a dedicated feeder, which can keep them from getting at your other stuff. Um, this is just a cool image um, of a time when we just had a whole bunch of birds feeding on the ground, um, but I used it to show the rabbit. Rabbits also can be satisfied if you just give them a place to eat um, like corn feeders, but they're another common animal that'll come to your feeders. And we don't get bears commonly, but we have had two times in our history of living here where bear, a bear has come through and torn, totally dismantled our feeders. Um, so that's happened to us twice here in Stillwater. Um, if you live in bear country, you will need to suspend feeders above the height that a bear can get to. Um, I've seen um, amazing pulley systems used to uh, lower the feeders so that you can get at them and then raise them out of sight or out of reach. Um, uh, so you can uh, also, some people just literally take down their feeders in bear season. And sometimes that's all winter, but sometimes the, the time we had them was in April when they were just moving out of hibernation and uh, trying to find food on their way to some place that was more protected. So bears. Okay, we made